Marketing Misfits. I'm your host, Melinda, and today we are going to talk about near-death experiences. And I'm going to give a couple of my experiences, but um, I would love to hear yours. So if you want to email them to me, you can send them to mystery.loves.company.pod at gmail.com. So we will just go ahead and get right into the storytelling. Um, so I'm just, I will start with when I was in the third grade. Uh, so I've had, I've had a few near death experiences in my life, but I will talk about the two that uh, I remember the very most. And, um, the first one is when I was in the third grade, I remember I was super tired and I didn't think I was sick and I kind of wanted to play hooky. I just wanted to lay down and sleep. I've always been kind of a sleepy girl. And, uh, I asked my mom if I could stay home from school. And so she let me lay in her bed and watch her TV, which was a huge treat, by the way. And um, when my mom got home, she freaked out a little bit because her TV was not on in her bedroom. And so she was just, this is not normal. This is not okay. What's wrong with my girl? So she comes in to check on me and I'm faking being asleep because I'm faking being sick. Like I'm not even sick. I don't even feel sick. I'm just sleepy. And I remember my mom shaking me, like trying to wake me up. Mindy, 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 wake up. And I've got my eyes closed and in my head I'm laughing and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm tricking her so bad. I'm just tricking her so bad. I was such a naughty girl. Not really, I was a really good girl until I was a teenager. That doesn't matter. Anywho, so, um, all of a sudden I feel my mom like bouncing and she's got me in her arms and she's running and she puts me in the car and, uh, and still at this point in time, I'm like, oh man, I'm getting her good. I'm getting her really good. Like she totally thinks I'm sleeping. And then we get to a hospital and I hear my mom fighting with somebody saying, no, somebody needs to take my baby. Somebody needs to take my baby. And I remember the lady at the desk arguing with her and I remember my mom getting really mad. <clears throat> so then at that point in time, I was like, oh, this isn't so funny anymore. And so I tried to open my eyes to show my mom, hey, I'm okay. I'm all right, like, let's go home. And I couldn't open my eyes. And I was just like, I could think all the things, I could say all the things, but I couldn't, I thought I could. And um, so then I feel myself being bounced again, super, super fast. And apparently a nurse had walked by and she grabbed me out of my mom's arms and just started running down the hallway. And my fever was 105. My, my mom says that like I was, I was too hot to touch. And so they tried to, I guess they tried to put an IV in me and somehow my IV like exploded or something and it wouldn't work. And so then they had to put me in this like ice bath. And oh, I remember it so vividly, so vividly. And I was screaming and screaming and screaming, but nobody could hear me. Nobody could hear me screaming. Like I was going nuts, this ice bath hurt. It was horrible. It was the most horrible thing I've ever felt in my life. But nobody could hear me screaming but me. And um, so it turns out I had walking pneumonia. Uh, I thought I was faking being sick. Uh, the doctor did tell my mom, had you gotten her here any later, like she would not be here anymore. Like, I guess at that point in time, my fever was pretty much cooking my brain, which explains so much. <laughs> it explains so much. I don't think my mom would laugh about that, but I can laugh about it because I'm here and things make sense. <laughs> so that is my first near-death experience that, um, that I can really remember. I do know that I was in the hospital for uh, three and a half weeks on that one. And I remember the whole police station because my mom and my grandma, they were 
friends with the entire police force. So the whole police station comes in and they visit me in the hospital and they're bringing me stuffed animals. And it was just really cool to be doted on like that. When you're in third grade, that's like a, a huge thing. You're getting all this attention. Um, but, and I got to eat all the snack packs, all the chocolate puddings that I wanted, all of them. I, I think I'm pretty sure they had to go make special orders because I was there, but that doesn't, whatever. That is my first near-death experience that I can actually remember. Okay, so near-death experience number two. I was, mm, I think, right about 29, maybe 30 years old-ish, somewhere right in there, and I had just had a hysterectomy. And um, I had heard all these stories about how amazing you feel after a hysterectomy. And, you know, you have to refrain from doing things because you feel so good. And I just, I just didn't get that. I never got the, oh man, I'm totally energized. Like they even warned me about not vacuuming. I, I guess that's a thing. You want to vacuum. I didn't want to vacuum. I didn't want to do anything but sleep. And uh, again, sleepy me, tired girl. Um, so then I just started feeling really, really, really crummy. And like my eyes burned. So I knew I had a fever. Like I can always tell when I have a fever because my eyes will burn. And um, so I told my husband, I was just like, man, I am not doing well. I think I need to go back to the doctor. And so I went back to the doctor and I told him how I was feeling. And he tells me, oh, you, you just have a bladder infection. And I was just like, you know, I've had bladder infections in my life. I have. Uh, usually you have to piss in a cup. And then they test it and then tell you if you have an infection. I didn't pee in a cup. He just looks at me and decides I have a bladder infection. I'm like, well, no, I'm not having any symptoms of a bladder infection. I'm telling you, I feel like shit. There's something wrong. And he's like, nope, totally common. You have a bladder infection, sends me home with an antibiotic. So then uh, for a couple of days, I actually was starting to feel somewhat better. And I'm like, well, shoot, maybe this was a bladder infection and just not one that I've ever felt before because didn't have any of the classic symptoms, but who am I? I'm not a doctor. And, uh, so then I'm done with my antibiotics and almost immediately I'm back in bed. And I tell my husband, like, it's daily. I'm just like, I am sick. I am sick. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with me. I can feel it. I'm sick. And I can understand, like, he he took such good care of me. And then it got to the point, he was just like, babe, I love you. I got to go to work. I got to go to work. And I can understand that 100%. And I was talking to my mom on the phone at one point in time and I was crying and I was just like, mom, there is truly something wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm telling you there's something wrong with me. And she said, baby, I'm coming to get you. And I said, no, I'm tired. I'm tired. I just need to sleep this off. Like I can't even keep my eyes open. And I'm like, but my body hurts. I'm just achy and I just want you to know I don't feel good like I just wanted someone to know I wasn't doing fine which is so out of character for me because typically if I'm sick I I won't even say I'm sick I've, I'll just pretend I'll carry on about my business I'll go to work I'll do all the things I'll go to the grocery store I'll do all the things but at that point in time I was just like there something's different and so my mom wouldn't listen so she shows up at my house She's like, get, get in the car, we're going to the hospital. And I was like, okay. And she's like, we're not going to your hospital. We're not going to where your doctor is. We are going to Boise. And I said, all right, fine. We get to the hospital and the triage nurse, you know, asked what was happening. And I told her, and I had told her that I had had a hysterectomy um, about two weeks ago and that I haven't felt right since. And I've just been sick since. And, um, 
told her about what happened at my doctor with all of it or whatever. And, you know, usually you'll sit in an ER for a while before they call you back to get you into your room or whatever. Oh, no. I, not so much did I get done saying those words before I was back in a room. And then that, like, I didn't even have to wait in this ER room. The doctor was in there almost as fast as I was in there. And I was just like, holy shit, like, this is a fantastic hospital. These guys are Johnny on the spot. Not realizing what they knew was taking place. When I had my hysterectomy, the doctor had actually clipped my colon and my entire body went septic. I, I was just a sepsis pool. And I mean, not only that, but he left some tools in there too, which they got out. But um, anyway, so the doctor, you know, gets me up in the stirrups. He's looking up there and he's like, oh shit, you're going back to surgery. <laughs> like right now you're going to surgery. And I was just, I was confused. My mom was having a total panic attack, trying to get a hold of my husband to be like, uh, shit's happening. And, um, that is the last I remember being like a hundred percent there. Um, I remember, and my mom has told me that they had me in an induced coma and I was on a ventilator. I was very, very, very sick. Um, apparently I had actually died a couple of times and they, they had to bring me back. But, um, so they did have me in an induced coma and my mom was sitting there and, uh, she asked the doctor if, um, or the nurse, I'm sorry. She asked the nurse, can she hear me? Can she hear me? Can she feel me? Does she know I'm here? And the nurse says, no, she, she can't hear anything. She doesn't know anything. Like she's in a coma. And my mom grabs my hand and holds it and she says, I'm here, sweet baby. And apparently I like sat straight up and my eyeballs went like golf balls. And my mom said that I looked so terrified that she couldn't even believe it. And then after a second, I laid back down and I was out. And the nurse was just like, what the fuck just took place? Like she's in a coma. And my mom, she's just like, oh my God, baby, baby, baby. And the nurse looks at my mom and she's like, you guys must have a very, very strong bond. And my mom said, oh, we do, we do. And so then, like, that's all I really remember from that point in time. I was in an induced coma for a little while. Um, I guess I don't know exactly how long or how many days, I'm not sure, but, uh, I do remember like coming to um, after, you know, they were bringing me out of my coma. I remember coming to and I thought I was being tortured, like literally tortured. I thought somebody had kidnapped me and I was being tortured. My arms were strapped down to this bed and my legs were strapped down and I was suffocating. Oops, sorry. Oops. Um, I was suffocating. And I was just like, oh my God, somebody's trying to kill me. Somebody's trying to kill me. I am strapped down to this bed and they're suffocating me. And I and I start freaking out. So then I go into fight or flight mode and I start pulling whatever is in my throat. I start pulling it out with my teeth. Like I clamp my teeth around it and then I start just pulling and I do little by little and I'm bound to determine I'm gonna get the shit out of my throat because nobody's gonna torture me to death and nobody's gonna fucking kill me. Like that's what's not gonna happen. And so I'm, my, I can't use my hands. So I gotta use the only thing I can, which is my teeth. And at that point in time, a nurse comes running into my room and she's freaking out, telling me to stop, telling me to stop. And I'm thinking she's one of the bad guys because this brain, right? And, uh, so she, she's telling me, you have to stop. You're going to hurt yourself. You have to stop. And I'm just looking at her like, you don't understand. I'm suffocating. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. And uh, so then she goes and, you know, like reduces the little balloon that's in there or whatever and has me cough while she pulls this thing out of my throat. 
I had no clue that I was ventilated. I had no idea that's what it was. I just woke up feeling like I had been tortured. And I know that I was, I slept for days. I was in the hospital for weeks, like weeks. Um, I know it was at least three weeks I was in the hospital and I was in the ICU for, I was in the ICU for almost three weeks and then they had to move me up to the cancer floor because um, they had to put my IV in right here, um, which I guess is called a port. And the only floor that really knows how to deal with a port is the cancer floor. So uh, they had to move me up there, but um, yeah, I was a very sick girl. And I remember the day that I was like fully, fully alert. My doctor comes in, the one that saved my life. And he stands in the doorway and he shakes his head and he's like, oh my God, I'm staring at a ghost. And I'm like, what? He's like, I'm literally staring at a ghost. You shouldn't be here. I'm like, I shouldn't be here. He's like, no, we lost you so many times. We lost you so many times. He's like, there's no way you should have lived through this. No way you should have lived. And I was just like, holy shit, what the hell has happened? Because I still don't know all the things. And so then he goes through and explains everything that has happened. And, um, the amount of medications, like everything that I was on, I was blown up like the Michelin tire man. Like if you touched me, my whole body went blur. Like I was huge because of all the fluids that they've got rushing through me. And um, this doctor, he checked on me day in and day out. He was such an amazing, amazing, amazing person. I cannot sing his praises enough. Um, I actually begged him to become my doctor after this and he did. It was, it was cool. He did. He wasn't accepting new patients, but he did accept me. So that was awesome. Um, but I'm curious because with both of my near death experiences and one of them, like I did die multiple times or whatever, I didn't like see a light or anything like that. And I, so I hear so many stories and I read so many stories on people who have died and come back or people who have almost died, you know, been on that brink or whatever. And sometimes they see a light, like a divine light. And sometimes they see some super scary, scary shit. Um, sometimes like they see, like they see Jesus or they, what, like they see so many different things. And I'm just like, well, I didn't see anything. Not that I remember, like, what does that mean? Does everybody see something when they die and come back or almost die and come back? Does everybody see something or do, is it just like a select few? Is it like a chosen few who see something? Like, I would love to know the answer to that because I'm sitting here like, why, why didn't I see something cool? I want to see something cool. So anyway, that is my second story of my near death experience. Um, there will be more in the future. Uh, I'll have my mom on here at some point in time and she can just fill your cup with all the shit that's happened. I was the troublesome child because I liked to, uh, I like to get sick apparently, whatever. Um, but that's all I have for today. So thank you for joining Mystery Loves Company. And again, if you have any near death experiences, please, please email them to me at mystery.loves.company.pod at gmail.com. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.